Welcome back, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. D.B. Sanders, Associate Director of the CF Center at Riley Hospital for Children and an Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Indiana University School of Medicine in Indianapolis. His research focuses on epidemiologic and clinical studies of pulmonary exacerbations and early life events that contribute to CF lung disease. A warm welcome to Dr. Sanders, who will present pulmonary exacerbations in the era of highly effective CFTR modulators. Welcome, Dr. Sanders. All right, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak here today. And uh, thanks to everybody who's who's logging on and uh, hopefully there are no uh, technical difficulties on my end. I know the, the organizers have it all set. Um, I have, I start with a disclosure slide. I have no, no real disclosures other than some work with the CF Foundation and grant supports. Um, and I uh, just have a, a brief outline of what I wanted to run through today. Um, I'll talk a little bit about pulmonary exacerbations. I, I'm sure a lot of people on the call know more about them than I do, but I just wanna make sure we have some similar background. Then I will go through some of the pulmonary exacerbation data in the, uh, the CFTR modular studies, some of the big ones that were in the New England Journal. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the studies that have been published recently that show our uh, real world experience with modulators and how they how how well they perform outside of um, outside of those clinical studies. And again, probably something you guys know better than I do. And then I'll talk about some ongoing research uh, with pulmonary exacerbations that I've been involved with um, and and where things are going now that um, both both in the area when, when lots of people have access to modulators, but also when when some people still uh, don't have access. All right, just so some background on pulmonary exacerbations. Um, typically, we recognize an exacerbation as uh, an increase in respiratory symptoms above baseline. Uh, cough, especially in pediatrics, may be the only, uh, the only symptom of a pulmonary exacerbation, but oftentimes we can see increase in sputum production, decrease in exercise tolerance, uh, fatigue, uh, fevers, uh, chest pain, need for um, absence from school or work, and uh, oftentimes accompanied by a decrease in pulmonary function. Um, the occurrence of a pulmonary exacerbation is associated with um, some negative outcomes. Uh, some of these are uh, a little bit of a chicken in the egg phenomenon, but um, definitely something we worry about and want to make sure we're treating pulmonary exacerbations well. So uh, having a pulmonary exacerbation is treated with IV antibiotics uh, is associated with progression of lung disease. Um, poor quality of life, especially uh, while symptomatic and, and missing work or school or, or distracted at work or school because of increased healthcare needs. Um, increased healthcare expenditures associated with hospitalization and antibiotics. Um, and then for uh, people with CF with advanced lung disease, there is an association with uh, frequency of pulmonary exacerbations and, uh, and mortality. Uh, in terms of treatments, uh, it generally is a combination of uh, increased frequency of airway clearance, antibiotics, uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about um, uh, oral versus IV versus inhaled antibiotics, uh, attention to nutrition, especially if there's been weight loss, rest if possible. Um, and I'll talk in a second about some of the um, pulmonary exacerbation guidelines uh, that were published by the CF Foundation with Patrick Flume as lead author uh, about 12 years ago. Um, but having pulmonary exacerbations uh, or the treatment of pulmonary exacerbations has been associated with some uh, possible poor outcomes. So we worry about incomplete recovery of uh, symptoms and, and lung function. Um, also, uh, the treatment often takes time away from school and work. Um, it seems like uh, once somebody has been treated in the hospital or with IV antibiotics, uh, especially more than a couple of times, the, there's a shortened time of the next exacerbation. Some of that is um, you know, just that feeling that, well, IVs worked for me last time and it's time for IV antibiotics again. A couple of other things we often don't talk about, um, antibiotic side effects, uh, although we should talk about that more, um, obviously with the, the GI distress, uh, but we also worry more about um, acute kidney injury. And I know there's a talk, there's going to be a talk on hearing injury um, and vestibular damage, um, as well as complications from venous access devices, especially ports and picks uh, that, that they can be affected. Um, and uh, so obviously avoiding uh, a treatment or the need for treatment of exacerbations uh, would be beneficial for a lot of reasons. 
Um, this is a, a summary of the, the guidelines that were published in 2009 with, with Patrick Fluman. On the left, left hand side of the screen um, is sort of the, the grade of, of consensus recommendations that were used. Um, I, I indicates there's insufficient evidence to grade A, means there's high likelihood of benefit of, uh, of a treatment. A B, it means there's a moderate likelihood of, of benefit, and the, and the asterisk here indicates this, uh, this is due to previous guidelines and not new data. Uh, C means that there's a recommendation against the routine use of a, of a treatment. And then D was that we're gonna re recommend against for everyone. And I think the first thing to notice, um, they looked at 10 questions and, and there wasn't a single area where there was high likelihood of benefit, grade A evidence to, to recommend something. Um, there was some uh, likelihood of benefit to continuing chronic medications and um, airway increased frequency of airway clearance, but actually there, there, um, uh, there wasn't any new data to, to, to base this on. Um, I think our standard now is to just use uh, IV tobramycin once daily, um, but at that time there wasn't enough uh, evidence to recommend. Um, and then uh, around this time is when we did have evidence that routine synergy testing of antibiotics did not seem to be helpful in improving clinical outcomes. And then you see all these I, these incomplete or insufficient evidence to grade. And these are obviously really important um, treatment aspects that would be great to know um, uh, you know, how to, to, to optimize treatment. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about um, how we're working to develop some of the evidence uh, for these. Um, but it is sort of surprising that we don't have great evidence and still don't have great evidence for the, where's the best set of treatment, the, the ideal uh, duration of antibiotics, although I'll, I'll talk about a new study that, that touches on that. Um, whether to continue to inhale the antibiotics, inhale tobramycin when we're starting IV tobramycin, one versus two antibiotics for pseudomonas, which uh, seems like a question that would have been answered a long time ago. It turns out that there's um, not great evidence for that. Uh, obviously the use of, of steroids and pulmonary exacerbation, we've been long struggled with the best way to use these. Um, and then, uh, there, you know, we have talked more about extending duration of antibiotics that are in the beta-lactam family, like, uh, uh, unicillin, unicillin, cefepimes, uh, ceftrax, and those sorts of things. All right, so those were the evidence for treatment uh, of pulmonary exacerbations, which probably need to be updated. Now I'm going to turn back to sort of the focus of the title of my talk, which is um, the, the effects of CO2 modulators on uh, pulmonary exacerbations. So I'll go through some of the studies. Uh, this first one was uh, really the first big uh, uh, study of Ivacaftor that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2011 with Bonnie Ramsey as the, uh, the lead author. This study was in people with CF who are at least 12 years of age and had at least one copy of G551D mutation. Um, and this uh, it, during the 48-week study, um, about a third of recipients of Ivacaftor had a pulmonary exacerbation. And this was uh, based on uh, the modified Fuchs criteria or a combination of signs and symptoms. And 59% uh, of placebo recipients also had a pulmonary exacerbation. So there was a risk reduction of a pulmonary exacerbation of 55% over that year. And this graph on the right sort of, sort of shows that a reduced risk. So this graph shows the proportion of participants who had not had an exacerbation. Um, so at the start of the study, 100% had not yet had an exacerbation. And then this gray line uh, is indicative of the placebo recipients you can see that the, the, um, the number of people who are having at least one exacerbation is increasing frequently. And by 24 weeks, about half of placebo recipients had had at least one pulmonary exacerbation and less than a quarter of Ivacaftor recipients had had one. Um, and you can see that these, these, these graphs continue out to 48 weeks. In addition to have, looking at the reduction of any pulmonary exacerbation, the authors also reported on the re reduction of uh, pulmonary exacerbations treated with IV antibiotics uh, there was no set criteria for when to use IV antibiotics. It was up to the, the treating clinician, but they found that there was a 40% reduction in the use of IV antibiotics during the study. Um, I'm going to skip to the next, uh, uh, I guess I'm going to skip over Lumacaftor, Ivacaftor, and just touch on uh, Tezacaftor, Ivacaftor. Uh, this, this appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2017 with uh, Jennifer Taylor Kosar, the lead author. This again was in people with CF who were at least 12 years of age, and this time had two copies of F5 weight del. Um, in this study, 25% uh, of the Teziva recipients had at least one pulmonary exacerbation. Um, this was only in a six-month study instead of a year, 
and 35% of the placebo re recipients had, a, had a, at least one pulmonary exacerbation. That was lower than the previous study when over half of uh, placebo, placebo recipients had a pulmonary exacerbation, and that was a longer time frame. During the six-month study, there was a 36% reduction in any pulmonary exacerbations, and when we looked at um, the risk of IV antibiotics, it was reduced by 47%. So again, some really nice reduction in, uh, in, in symptoms that, that are coming to the level of needing treatment, and especially in symptoms uh, coming to the level of needing IV antibiotics. All right, and then here's uh, one of the studies that on uh, Alexa Kaftor, Tesla Kaftor, Iva Kaftor, or Trikafta that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine two years ago. Um, this is again in people with CF who are at least 12 years of age. And this study was uh, people who had had at least one copy, uh, who had uh, at least one copy of f 5 weight del um, in this study, uh, which I again believe was 24 weeks, 25% uh, of um, Trikafta recipients and over half, 56% of placebo recipients had at least one pulmonary exacerbation. Um, this graph on the bottom is a little bit different than, um, than the, the prior graphs, but it shows that the num estimated number of exacerbations per patient per year, per participant per year. And so in, in the gray, in the... Um, placebo group that there was about one or just below one exacerbation per patient per year during the study. And in the Trikafta recipients, it was reduced all the way down to 0.37. So there was a basically over a 60% reduction in pulmonary exacerbations. And if we look over here on the, the right-hand side at pulmonary exacerbations leading to hospitalization and pulmonary exacerbations treated with IV antibiotics, um, the, the, the rate in the placebos was, was, uh, was low about one in four placebo recipients uh, had a pulmonary exacerbation leading to hospitalization uh, over a one year period. And that, uh, that risk was reduced by almost 80% in Trikafta. So clearly great benefit. This wasn't the, the primary outcome of the study, but something that they, they've monitored closely and um, uh, obviously very encouraging uh, uh, in, in the hopes of avoiding any of those, those uh, outcomes that I, I mentioned before. Um, I, I do want to point out just one piece of maybe not perfect news in terms of how, um, how CFGR modulators affect pulmonary exacerbations. And that was looking at one of the outcomes that I mentioned before, the incomplete recovery from pulmonary exacerbation. So Patrick Flume did a secondary data analysis after the STRIVE study was completed. This was the study that I mentioned that uh, included people with CF 12 years and above who had had, had at least one copy of G551D. As I mentioned before, Ivacaftor reduced the risk of pulmonary exacerbations, pulmonary exacerbations by about 57%. Um, but when uh, they looked at the percent of participants recovering back to 100% of their pre-exacerbation lung function, the story is a little different. So this um, figure kind of shows what I'm trying to explain. So, so if you think about this as a hypothetical patient who before their exacerbation, their, their FEV1, sort of the main pulmonary function test that we monitor was about 100% predicted. Let's say at the time of the exacerbation, they had fallen all the way to 80%. And then we look at the short-term recovery. In this study, it was um, the next clinic visit following the exacerbation. And, and in this case, they're not all the way back to 100% of their baseline. They, they got back to 95%. And in almost all cases, these participants you know, feel a lot better, um, but they're not all the way back. And, and in, then in this study, um, they also looked at the FEV1 at the end of the study. And in this hypothetical scenario, this FEV1 does recover all the way back uh, to 100% of baseline um, at the end of the study. And we can use a, a, any different baseline. If, if the baseline is 80% predicted, then we would hope that by the end of the exacerbation, especially the end of the study, that the FEV1 would be back to 80% predicted. Um, but in fact, there wasn't much of a difference at all between um, those on Ivacaftor and whether or not they recovered um, back to 100% of their baseline, both in the short term and the long term. Um, in both cases, it was just about half of, of patients or participants got all the way back there. And this was really not different at all from the placebo group. We, I think we would be hoping for a much higher recovery of baseline than, um, than we saw. Now, um, I, I do need to point out that this recovery to baseline maybe has some statistical concerns that, um, that does make it hard to achieve 
And I think it, one of the things that it doesn't note is that if the ivory capture participants got back to 99% of their baseline, but the placebo recipients on average got back to 90% of their baseline, well, I think there's still, we could say there's, there's benefit to that. But I just want to point it out with all the great news of CFTR modulators that there is some, there's some information we're still, um, still trying to figure out in terms of how, um, how they affect pulmonary exacerbations. Okay, so, so those are some of the main uh, studies, clinical studies that, that show the, the effectiveness of CFTR modulators. And now uh, I wanna look at some of the studies that have looked at the performance of CFTR modulators once they're in the real world and are able to be prescribed widely. Um, so there's most of the data comes from IvoCaftor. Um, we've had that around the, the longest. It's, it's available uh, most widespread, although still uh, not available to everybody. Um, in the U.S., a study using insurance claims data uh, showed a reduction of 20, 26% of oral antibiotics in the three years after starting IvoCaptor. That is lower than um, that was reported in the, um, the uh, IvoCaptor study, um, but there was a 77% reduction in IV antibiotics, but that, and that was actually uh, higher. So that, that's helpful to know that this effect seems pretty durable moving from the, the clinical study to the real world. In France, where they did a different study, more prospective monitoring of, of patients and not looking at a, a claims database, they saw very similar study results, um, a reduction of 43% of any pulmonary exacerbations uh, treating with antibiotics in the 12 months after starting Avocaftor and 75% reduction in IV antibiotic treated exacerbations. Sorry, going back to the US uh, data, I did want to mention that um, this, this number stayed down for almost the entire three years. So, so there wasn't a waning of the effect of the reduction of pulmonary exacerbations. So that, that, again, was encouraging. And in Canada, um, they, they used their CF Canadian registry, and they saw only an 18% reduction in IV antibiotics uh, in the 12 months after starting IV capture. But actually, this was a pretty healthy cohort, and there really wasn't a lot of um, IV antibiotics to start with. So, um, so I think that's, uh, um, you know, we still saw a reduction even in, in pretty healthy patients, but it was maybe smaller than what we had uh, seen in the clinical studies. Uh, another recent um, interesting study was comparison of registry data from the U.S. and the United Kingdom. Um, and again, they sort of took the long view and looked at data from 2012 to 2016, and they compared um, pulmonary exacerbation rates to match control patients who are not on Ivacaptor. So similar patients, but who either were not on Ivacaptor or who were not treated with Ivacaptor. In the UK, we saw about a 40% reduction in any pulmonary exacerbations in the three years after starting Ivacaptor. And again, about 40% reduction in IV antibiotic treated exacerbations. Um, and that effect seemed to, to last throughout those three years. In the US, we found very similar results. Uh, we had a little bit longer follow-up from the introduction of uh, Ivacaptor into the U.S. market. Um, but again, about a 35% reduction in any pulmonary exacerbation and a 40%, almost 40% reduction in IV antibiotic-treated exacerbations. Um, so the, the reduction in exacerbation symptoms was a little bit less than uh, what was reported in the studies. There was about a 55% uh, reduction. But the reduction in IV antibiotics, uh, which is maybe the treatment we really want to avoid, um, was very similar. So very encouraging uh, that, that this data continues and continues for several years after the introduction. All right, now I want to talk about the effect of, of Trikaptor or Alexacaptor, Tezacaptor, Ivacaptor on pulmonary exacerbations in the real world. And, and the, I think the major difficulty with this is that we introduced um, Trikaptor into the US market just before the, um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So there's a lot of difficulty pulling out this data um, but uh, I have here a, a modification of a figure that was published uh, by the CF Foundation um, this year that looked at the, the proportion of people with CF who were treated with IV antibiotics in every month from January 2019 to uh, November of 2020. And again, uh, Trikafta was introduced at the end of, or excuse me, in November of 2019 for people with CF who are at least 12 years of age and at least one copy of F5 rate Dell. And we really saw the effects of COVID-19 lockdowns and, and um, shutdowns and social distancing around February, March of, of 2020. So I'll start by showing the percent of, of children with CF uh, who are less than 12 years of age who are true with IV antibiotics in any given month. And prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, it was really about 2% of, of, of less than 12 year olds were um, true with IV antibiotics every month. 
And then uh, we see a little bit of an increase around the, the winter viral season. And then with the introduction of the pandemic, this number goes way down, almost to zero. And then while there is a rebound after we started to loosen some of the restrictions, um, and got back into school last fall, this, this number is still uh, well below uh, baseline. And then when we look at the people who are eligible for Trikafta here in purple, you can see that the, the average, uh, uh, portion, average percent of people uh, with CF who are in the hospital or on IV antibiotics in any, in any month is about 8%. Uh, prior to the introduction of Trikafta. And then here with introduction of Trikafta, and again, we don't have exact start dates, but you can see the really precipitous drop in use of IV antibiotics uh, after the introduction. Um, this decrease continues um, into the start of the pandemic and then levels off um, well below uh, prior levels. And uh, it is sort of hard to, to sort out how much of, of this effect is, is social distancing and 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 all those aspects versus how much is trichafta. But I think we, it's safe to say there's a large effect of trichafta and re reducing pulmonary exacerbations in the real world. Um, and then if we look at the same age group, but who didn't have any F5 weight delta, so not eligible for trichafta, we see that there was pretty similar, maybe a little bit lower rates of, of uh, host or IV antibiotics during this time period. And this does include people, uh, a higher percent of people who are pancreatic sufficient and, and probably less severe lung disease you see that as the, the numbers start to go down with Trikafta, that there really wasn't any change at all until we get to this month of, of March and April when we really saw the decrease in uh, the use of IV antibiotics. Um, we see that there was a rebound, kind of a large rebound actually, but again, not, not to, to prior levels. So there may be a way to sort out how much of this giant effect in the, the purple is, is related to Trikafta versus the pandemic. But I think it's safe to say that that in the, in the early data, um, Trikafta has just performed wonderfully in um, keeping people out of the hospital. And I don't have great data, but it's also um, really encouraging to know that we're really reducing the, the rate of oral antibiotics um, uh, as well. All right, one last point on uh, the use of, of Trikafta, and that's uh, the, the effects of uh, Trikafta on pulmonary exacerbations in people with CF with advanced lung disease. And there were two reports that just recently came out. One was in the Columbia CF Center where they saw, just like in the original New England Journal article, an, almost an 80% reduction in pulmonary exacerbations after starting Trikafta in their patients who had advanced lung disease, which was generally considered an FEV1 less than 40% predicted. This study was, was conducted over the time of the um, pandemic. So they compared to their advanced lung disease, their, their patients with advanced lung disease who were not treated with Trikafta and they saw just a 40% reduction in exacerbation. So this was double the effect of, of just the lockdown in and of itself. And then the Dublin CF Center reported over 80% reduction in pulmonary exacerbations in their, um, their patients with CF and advanced lung disease. So again, these are really encouraging signs. Um, and this was in people who were excluded from the original studies because they're lower uh, lung function. All right, I'm gonna turn away a little bit from uh, CFTR modulators and talk about some of the other ways we're trying to optimize treatment of pulmonary exacerbations um, today. So just one more piece of background before I get into that, and that's this, this data. Um, this is data from a prospective observational study by Scott Sagel. Um, from uh, Denver in 2015 and a secondary data analysis led by Sonia Helchi um, from the TDN that appeared in 2016. This is a prospective study of 123 adolescents and adults with CF who were treated with IV antibiotics. In this figure, each column represents an individual um, uh, participant in the study and the height of the column indicates how long they are treated with IV antibiotics. And in this prospective study where we're kind of monitoring a lot of things, there's a wide range of treatment durations. The shortest was five days, but the, the longest treatment was up to 61 days for pulmonary exacerbations. And this is just with IV antibiotics. It doesn't include oral antibiotics before or after. Um, if we look at the types of antibiotics that were used, we can also see the wide variety of, of antibiotics. In fact, in this legend, we we're running out of room and we had to say there were other antibiotics and other other antibiotics. Um, and you can see orange is the tobermycin that, that occurs the most often, but there's a, a wide range of antibiotics to choose from. And then um, you can also see, in addition, the use of oral antibiotics and inhaled antibiotics in additional patients within this study. Um, and while uh, in one sense, we do want to personalize the care of our 
uh, of our pulmonary exacerbations and, and people with CF, it's hard to say that we, we have 75, you know, or so different perfect treatments um, for these 123 uh, uh, exacerbations. Um, and while uh, I think personalization um, hopefully will be help, helpful in, in recovering from exacerbations, the other thing is it makes it really hard to study how to optimize treatment. And so one way to, 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 um, to improve treatment, to do research in exacerbations is to start to standardize some aspects of care so then we can start to look at other factors. So the STOP2 study was the first, um, seems where the STOP2, the second study was the first study, but the STOP2 study was the first interventional study that, uh, that was led by uh, uh, Patrick Flume, and Chris Goss, and, the, um, uh, at, and at the TDN um, to look at, at treatment duration of IV antibiotics. And in this study, they, we enrolled adults with CF who are already being treated with IV antibiotics for pulmonary exacerbation. So right at the start of their exacerbations, they were enrolled. And then, then the treatment duration was based on um, symptom and FEV1 response or lung function response. And this, uh, it basically became two studies in one. So for, um, so participants were enrolled on day one or two at day seven to 10 of IVs, um, their, their progress was checked and then they were assigned different treatment duration based on that progress. Um, and so if, if the, the response was good initially, then they were randomized to 10 to 14 days of treatment. But if improvement in FEV1 or symptoms was not great, then uh, the, the randomization was between 14 days and 21 days. And here's sort of the main outcomes. This is for the early rapid responders, those who were randomized to either 10 or 14 days. You can see that on admission, FEV1 was about 50% predicted. And within seven days, there was a really large over 15% predicted improvement. Two weeks after the end of the planned treatment duration, we have about a 13% improvement for those who were treated for 14 days and a very similar uh, improvement for those treated for 10 days. Um, while this number is a little bit lower, it's kind of hard to say that you need to stay in the hospital or on IV antibiotics for an additional 0.6% uh, predicted um, with all the, the, the negative effects uh, that can go with it. Um, and so, and, and you can see that there's sort of a wide range of outcomes here, but not enough to show that there was a, a, a benefit to staying in or, or being treated for those additional four, four days. When we looked at other outcomes, similarly, there was a large reduction in symptoms. This is a CRIS score, which is a standardized uh, symptom score. And uh, we're looking for an 11 point improvement. And so um, 11 point improvement is, is thought to be the minimal change that, that someone with CF could detect. Um, and so the, the initial improvement was great. And then there was really no difference in the symptom score uh, 24 to 20 days after the start of treatment. And the, the rate of weight gain also wasn't different, although there was a little bit difference in the, the initial weight, um, weight gain. If we turn to the other half of the study, the, um, the non-early responders or those who had a less robust initial response, we can look at FEV1 change. And again, um, patients started about 50% predicted. It was really hard to tell a difference at uh, enrollment. Um, there's only about a 3% improvement at day seven. And after 20, 14 days, excuse me, 14 days after 14 days of IVs, there's only about a 3% prediction improvement. If we extended treatment to 21 days, there was really no benefit at all. Same was true if we looked at symptoms, there was a reduction, that reduction was maintained for both groups. Um, and there was an improvement in weight, but it was also smaller. So the, um, the conclusion of the STOP2 study is that among those with an early ro robust response, 10 days is not worse than 14 days. For those with a less ro robust response, 21 days is not better than 14 days. I, I will stop here and say that this is on patient average, you know, across, we had a 1300 people in this study. So it's not to say that for each individual patient, that 14 days is the only answer, but I think that this provides some evidence if knowing where you are at day seven or day 14 or day 10, what should we do from here? And so I think that that, that is how I would interpret this data is that we can't, I can't tell you that staying longer is going to be better for everybody. Um, but maybe there are some people out there who, who definitely need those 21 days. So um, I want to throw that caveat in there. Also, the other caveat is we can't say that 10 days is equal to 21 days because those, those patients and their response were different. And maybe for me, the most important is that we can use a standardized treatment duration, probably 14 days, to allow for testing for other exacerbation treatment parameters. So now we can kind of go back to that original slide I showed you, narrow down the treatment durations and start to look at other factors. 
some of the factors that people are looking at include antibiotic selection. Should we be using antibiotics against anaerobic bacteria? How many antibiotics against pseudomonas should we be using? Again, this goes back to the, the treatment guidelines that came out 12 years ago. Um, there's a study in Canada looking at steroids for poor initial recovery, and then also some work to try and how can we optimize home IV experience um, for, for people who can't or don't want to be stuck in the hospital for the whole time. All right, I just want to spend the last few minutes of my talk talking about oral antibiotics. And as a pediatrician, um, you know, this is where the vast majority of my treatment is involved. This Venn diagram, which I haven't really thought about Venn diagrams for a while, but this is a paper by Jeff Wagner in 2013 that looked at all of the treatment, antibiotic treatments for about 45,000 pulmonary exacerbations in the, uh, in a, the epidemiologic study of CF database. And you can see in orange, in this orange and, and in this, this larger circle that the, the majority of antibiotics for pulmonary exacerbations are oral antibiotics, actually about 75% overall. So it makes sense to, to do some work to try and optimize oral antibiotic use. Um, we asked uh, members of the CF Foundation Community Voice, as well as center directors, what are the most important unanswered questions around uh, oral antibiotics? And you could see that um, parents, uh, the, the number one question is, what's the long-term impact of, of oral antibiotics? And, and, and concern about antibiotic overuse. And, and if I use antibiotics in my young children, when they're older, will we not have access to those because of resistance? Um, and these were the top two questions uh, on, the, uh, on the community voice side. Um, and then outside of CF, is there evidence for overuse of antibiotics? Well, I tell all my, my uh, children with CF or the parents to call us if you've had symptoms for four or five days and, and we'll consider antibiotics. Well, in children without CF who get a virus, they about half of them cough for at least 10 days. So I'm not even giving my kids with CF a fair shake if, if their siblings without CF are coughing for 10 days and I'm using antibiotics at day five. And in this study in, in children with non-CF bronchiectasis, um, when they had an exacerbation and were given a placebo, uh, about 40% symptoms resolved without antibiotics. So um, non-CF bronchiectasis is not the same as CF, but the bronchiectasis is definitely the airway injury we, we worry about in CF. And so um, is it, would it be possible to get rid of oral antibiotics, especially in people on highly effective CF germ modulators? So we want to study this, but we're not sure that that it's going to be possible. And so we, we're doing a pilot study, the Stop Peds pilot study, looking to see will a tailored therapy or watchful waiting approach where we try and avoid antibiotics be acceptable to parents and providers? Or will parents just say, hey, I know it's time for the antibiotics, we're not going to do this? Or will, will my colleagues say, no, no, I know when to, to do antibiotics, we're going to do that now? And then if we do wait, well, can we reduce antibiotic exposure? Um, and so this is the pilot study we're doing. And we're really trying to see like, does it work or not? And then later on, we're gonna find out, is it safe or not? So, um, so initially we're enrolling kids when they're well, um, we're following them until they have restoration symptoms, whether it's at a, a phone call or, or a clinic visit. If they're too sick, then they're excluded from our randomization. And we worked with uh, family, family groups and clinicians to decide what those criteria are. If they're not too sick, then they're randomized either to early um, excuse me, to uh, just a tailored therapy approach where we just start with increasing airway clearance, but only antib antibiotics if necessary. And those if necessary criteria were, um, were again vetted with, with parents and, and clinicians. Um, but more importantly, if, if, if everybody gets antibiotics, then this type of study is not going to work. The other randomization arm is to start right away with two, two weeks of oral antibiotics. And then we're seeing everybody back um, at, at 28 days after randomization. Um, I think I have a couple minutes just to go over. These are our inclusion and exclusion criteria for the exacerbations. So really we want families to call us within seven days of new cough uh, or worsening cough. Um, and then they'd be excluded if that co if cough is really constant during the day or waking from sleep, they have shortness of breath at rest or impacts on their usual activities or if they have fatigue or low energy for more than four days. And again, these were criteria that we worked through with, with families at multiple CF centers, as well as community voice to see if, is this the right balance of, of not withholding antibiotics um, for people who are too sick? And then, and then if we are randomized to not get antibiotics, when do we need to give them? And, um, and these were sort of the, the guidelines we came up with. If the cough is still worsening after four days, we need to start antibiotics and we can't wait any longer. If the cough is just kind of stuck after a week, we thought it's time. 
If the cough is improving, but not always resolved within two weeks, we thought we needed to, to provide oral antibiotics. And if ever a shortness of breath impacting usual activities occurs, it's time for antibiotics. Um, and, and again, this study is sort of to test, are, are these the right guidelines or are they, are they too conservative or they too, too liberal? So, um, and, and always with this study, there's the option to return to clinical care. Um, and, uh, and that's really what makes it the pilot study or feasibility study. Can, can we do this study? So this study is on, ongoing. We're, our goal is to enroll 120 children with CF and we're um, getting pretty close to that. Um, participation will continue at least through this winter with our goal is to randomize 80 exacerbations. Um, and uh, this puts me in the odd position of, of rooting for illnesses. So I feel sort of conflicted about that, but hopefully we'll find some good information to optimize treatment going forward. So the conclusions of my talk is that uh, it's definitely shown CF2 modulators, especially trichafta, can greatly reduce the frequency of point exacerbation. And hopefully going forward, a cold is just a cold and it's not gonna develop into something worse. worse. But in the meantime, we are working on additional efforts to optimize our exacerbation treatments, uh, multiple aspects of IV antibiotic treatment, as well as can we avoid or, or really target oral antibiotics correctly. So that's the end of my talk. I just, I have lots of acknowledgements, um, collaborators on STOP2 and stop PEDS uh, help at, at my hospital and through the CF Foundation. And, um, and thanks again for uh, being here today to listen to me talk, and I'm happy to take some questions. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Sanders. That was an incredible presentation. Now it is time for questions. Siri? Hello, yes, and thank you so much for that amazing presentation. The questions are coming in and starting from the top. Uh, Terry wants to know, should the improvement in response be based on the type of infection? Some are worse than others. Um, I think that that's a really good question. And uh, I think the, the hard part for us is that, um, you know, we, we just like a lot of aspects of CF, we see people with pseudomonas who are really easy to be treated and, and those who are really not easily to be treated. Um, however, we, I didn't mention there were some exclusion criteria. So, so we did keep um, people with active uh, non tuberculosis mycobacteria out of the studies, as well as those with um, B. cepatia. Because I think we are worried about, um, uh, uh, you know, the negative outcomes that have been seen with those. Um, we are looking at the effects um, uh, or the efficacy of the studies in, in different um, people with a, a history of different uh, microbiology. Um, we're still getting that data from the CF registry going back a couple of years so we can do that analysis. Um, James Curry wants to know, do, when you talk about days in hospital, does that also include home IVs? Um, I think that it, usually um, it was sort of the other way around. So uh, we would have hospitalization and then we would have days of IVs that would include hospitalization and IVs. And uh, um, the, uh, in the, in the Trikafta real world response, um, that was including all days of IVs um, in the hospital and at home. For the younger kids, obviously there's not many home IV days, um, but we try to try to kind of group all those together to try and look at the effects. I guess one statement I, I didn't make, but um, uh, you know, especially the beginning of the pandemic, did people avoid hospitalizations by doing more home IVs to stay out of the hospital? And um, it was really hard for me to say that across the board, we saw more home IVs or relatively more home IVs, but I think it's just because no one was getting sick and everyone was really avoiding the hospital altogether, or IVs altogether. Marty Karazi, should we be impressed with how large, as compared to IV antibiotics, the reduction in pulmonary exacerbations is? Uh, I, I guess I'm not sure I understand that question. I, I apologize if I was, uh, I don't, don't know where in the, the talk that came in. Um, Marty, if you want to retype in your question and then it will be forwarded through and we'll swing back to it. I would say, I mean, I think it really is a fantastic outcome, you know, um, and, you know, a lot of the chronic CF therapies that we've studied over the years, um, we've seen reductions in uh, pulmonary exacerbations, but I, I think that the ones uh, in these modulators really are impressive. Um, so it, they even kind of go above and beyond some of the exas reductions and exacerbations we saw in um, with, with pulmonizyme and hypertonic saline and, and azithromycin. 
Terry Ball asks, do you do a nasal swab to culture out the type of virus to decide the treatment? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Uh, uh, and it's, boy, it's, I really wish our, our viral studies were better in CF. And uh, um, there's some really great, you know, basic science studies that, that, talk, that talk about the impact of viruses and viruses and in, in causing more inflammation, more activity of pseudomonas or more infections with pseudomonas and other bacteria. Um, and we, we did get nasal swabs in the adult STOP2 study, and that data will be coming out, but even with 900 nasal swabs, it, it's hard to tell. <laughs> it's really hard to tell uh, which virus to worry about. So, uh, you know, I, I, I wish we had more data. And, and actually, I think the reduction exacerbations with the avoidance of viruses during the pandemic is, to me, the, the best viral study we have, is that when we got rid of viruses, exacerbations went away, even for people not on Trikafta. Linda asks, should AFB cultures be done when regular sputum cultures, regular sputum culture doesn't show anything, but you are sick? Yeah, I think uh, that's a good point. And um, I, I know it, uh, this is becoming more of a problem when, when fewer people are producing sputum, but uh, that's definitely on our radar, um, especially when we've tried oral antibiotics a couple of times, IV antibiotics, we're not getting anywhere. That's when you know, we're thinking about going to bronchoscopy, especially in pediatrics, to, to see if there's anything um, on AFB that we're missing. Um, this is a longer question uh, from Rebecca. What is being done on diagnosing exacerbations? If there's one lesson of adulthood, it is that making the call that you're sick is a challenge because of shifts in lung health. Inavailable baseline drops like, oh, sorry, in available baseline drugs like Trikafta that change physiology and life events or obligations that distract us from health. What is being done to better understand how adult patients or their doctors make the call on if exacerbation is at play? What can be done to improve recognition of exacerbations? Might this impact the variability and duration of treatment needed and increase full recovery of FEV1? Yeah, thanks. That's a really good question. And I'll be honest, one that we sort of punted on in stop two and even stop feeds um, is that we're, we're saying, okay, once the decision has been made to treat or once the decision is being made to call, um, now we'll do our study. And um, I didn't mention, but when we did the stop two study, we asked similarly, what are the most important questions for the community? And the number one question is, well, when do we start treatment? And it, it's just, it has been really hard. Um, I will say that in pediatrics, um, at least uh, quality improvement side, looking at treatment of smaller declines in lung function, um, uh, it's seen in clinic. Um, there are people working on different biomarkers that might be uh, uh, easier to detect, um, including uh, um, multi multiple breath washout. I've seen some studies looking at MRI, which maybe isn't a widely spread study, but, but maybe we'll provide us more information on the physiology, which I think is part of the question. So um, I, that to me, especially in the future, if, if it is, is, is this a cold or is this a cold? We need antibiotics. Um, and so I, I would really like to address that question, but we still have ways to go. And William Ho, will the recommendations be based upon the severity of CF in the individual patient or even the age of the patient, knowing that younger patients typically have less advanced lung disease than older patients. Yeah, uh, that that I think that would be excellent, and uh, we we definitely see differences in care based on age, um, just in practice or convention. Um, I, I would like to see. I think we still have a little bit ways to go to develop the evidence in general, but then um, I, I I do think that studies going forward are going to enroll different age group. And so those recommendations are going to uh, apply to different age groups. And Chris asks, does any of your data distinguish a percent of your cohorts that have asthma, which may or may not play a role in an increase in pulmonary exacerbations? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question too. Uh, in the pediatric studies, we're recording uh, medications. So, so if, if we'll be able to look at people who are on inhaled steroids, I know it's not the perfect um, uh, criteria to look at for asthma, but uh, sort of an easy thing for us to grab um, from the chart. In the uh, adult study, uh, IV antibiotics, um, we looked at wheezing um, and steroid use, and, and it was a little bit hard to say. So um, uh, I, I would say that um, 
we haven't looked at that very closely uh, just yet. And it seems that for so long, the um, standard go-to with exacerbations was quite often to throw in steroids, prednisone in particular. Is there any uh, hesitation now to use steroids in light of the COVID-19 vaccine and what we're seeing about the lack of antibody uh, development of antibodies? Yeah, that's that's true. I think I, I had not heard anything with that specific with, with CF, but I think um, just in general, we have um, so, 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 so much less IV antibiotics right now that we're, um, a lot of times it's the people who, who have needed a lot of IV antibiotics, we're still getting IV antibiotics and oftentimes we're, their care is very individualized and this worked for me last time and that didn't work for me last time. So, um, I think that, uh, COVID hasn't, you know, especially when we're able to swab in the hospital and make sure they don't have COVID then, um, then that, then that is sort of our guide for how to continue with with prednisone or not, but yeah, I haven't seen anything more globally for adjusting our treatments um, in the last year. Well, it struck me because I know someone who does not have CF, but does have an autoimmune disorder who, because of prednisone is not developing antibodies. And I thought, wow, this really actually does apply to our community very broadly. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, Another question from Emily Woods. Is there any data on hemoptysis occurrence since Tricapta? There, there probably is, but I, I haven't seen it. Um, and uh, I know that the CF Foundation is just coming out with their summary of the registry from last year, although there are a lot of uh, impacts on the registry data with, um, with, the, with the pandemic. So hopefully we'll have some of that data soon. And lastly, knowing that so many people in our community have developed resistance to certain antibiotics, do you, uh, antibiotics, do you have uh, any news on new classes that might be in the pipeline? Yeah, that's that's a we had a really great talk um, not too long ago from Ken Olivier, and so I, I think at the NIH he, he gave some good information, but um, I I have not. Um, but I, again, as a pediatrician, I'm less often in need of those those medications, so uh, unfortunately, that's something that my adult colleagues have to deal with more. So I'm thankful for that, but um, I, so I, I unfortunately can't add to that uh, question just yet. And I will say Paul Mohabir at Stanford, I, that would be a great resource. So I'll see what we can do, Emily, to answer that question. So I think that concludes the questions from everyone. So I am gonna turn the baton back to Jim, but I thank you so much, Dr. Sanders, for such an informative presentation. Thank you. Thank you.